So this first one, we're going to be speaking about um, urban agriculture, landscape design, permaculture, kind of a whole plethora of how we bring together design in urban spaces. Um, first off will be Tim Rennie from Ho Lincoln Holly Hamlet. And then we're going to have Andy Zatko from the city of Omaha. And um, rounding out uh, the initial part of it will be Gus Von Rowan, who works as the executive director of Omaha Permaculture. And so they're each going to share a few minutes about their work. And then we're going to move into kind of a dis panel discussion amongst the three. So we'll start out with some, que some prepared questions, and then we'll have time for the audience um, to join in and ask a few questions. So that'll be our first 45 to 50 minutes in here. And then we'll move to our second two speakers for this session. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tim. Good afternoon. I want to thank the Nebraska Water Center for including this breakout session on urban agriculture. As our native neighbors remind us, water is life but we can't live just off water. Our bodies need the food that water can grow. This is a map of the Holly Hamlet, where in a standard two acre residential block with no vacant lots, my neighbors and I have carved out four fifths of an acre, the equivalent of 80 yards of a football field for fresh food production and native plants for pollinators. In 12, just 12 blocks from downtown Lincoln, over 20 families from within the block and directly across the street are annually growing food for their tables and getting to know the neighbors they live among. We are just winding up our 14th consecutive gardening season since starting the Hamlet in 2010. In just the third year of operation, however, during the summer of 2012, when Nebraska endured the hottest and driest conditions on record, our Hamlet gardening project was jolted into the world of water and food policy when the city of Lincoln instituted watering restrictions, permitting outdoor watering only on designated days. Property owners were allowed to water just three days a week with a $500 fine for violating the policy. As you all know, without adequate water, grass lawns will go dormant, but vegetable and fruit plants die. On hearing of the threat of a $500 fine, my spouse, in no uncertain terms, informed me that I was to immediately call the Lincoln Water System and find out if food, call, if food gardens were exempt from the restrictions. I poo-pooed her concerns, assuring her that, of course, gardens weren't subject. Trust me, it's fine, I said. She wasn't having it. I was told to call that instant, muttering under my breath, I called the water department number and sounding embarrassed at having to even ask such a thing, explained that I was calling to double check that food gardens were exempt from the watering restrictions. No, I was informed by an officious voice, all outdoor watering was subject to the restrictions. Absolutely floored and aghast, I babbled out, wait a minute, you're saying that the water department is putting growing food on the same par as watering the lawn, washing the car, and filling the swimming pool? The new guidelines I was instructed covered all outside watering, and if I had concerns, I needed to take it up with my elected officials. And thus began my introduction into water and food policy as regards urban agriculture. Five months later, after speaking to numerous public officials and engaging in a goodly number of uncomfortable conversations, I was notified that food gardens were exempted from future water restrictions, but that we, we were to be darned miserly about our water usage. Lincolnites were forever overwatering their lawns. When the water restrictions were first announced that summer of 2012, the mayor's office had stressed that Lincoln residents needed to absorb this inconvenience to protect the, to protect the industry in the state that grew our food. It was the least we could do to aid the hand that was feeding us. This, I think, is a good time to stop and talk about the place and role of urban agriculture in our metropolitan areas 
and why it's vital we do whatever we can to support local food production all the way down to the residential neighborhood scale. Here are some factors that daily influence my thinking about urban agriculture. Seven things that every Nebraskan should know about our food supply. 90% of the $4.4 billion Nebraskans annually spend on food leaves the state. How? How's that even possible? We're an agricultural powerhouse. We grow feed, not food. The, this is from the Nebraska Corn Board. The fact is most of the corn in Nebraska does not end up in human food, human food, I can't talk, human food products. The vast majority of Nebraska's corn crop is fed to livestock in Nebraska and outside the state or transformed into ethanol. Then there's this statistic. This is from a US Department of Defense study. The average bite of food on our plate travels 1,346 miles to get there. Note the date, January 1969. That data is over 50 years old. You can bet that those food mile figures are much higher than 1,346. But the paragraphs below, that's current data. The United States imports about 15% of its overall food supply. More than half of the fresh fruit and almost a third of the fresh vegetables Americans buy now comes from other countries. Then, a little closer to home, the city of Omaha needs 2,500,000 pounds of food daily to meet the dietary requirements of its nearly half a million residents. Most of it, except for milk, imported from outside the region. <clears throat> Lincoln's nearly 300,000 inhabitants rely on the global food system to ship in the bulk of the one and a half million pounds they need daily. Then, just-in-time delivery. This is the national distribution policy we operate under in the United States. The typical grocery store and restaurant stocks just three days worth of inventory on the shelves. That's just 72 hours of supply. <clears throat> now, you can see by the date, September 1st, 2022, I put this slide together a year ago, but I pulled it out. This, was, uh, this slide was put together when California was still in the depths of the worst drought that it ex had experienced in 1,200 years and so forth. But since then, all right, California has been assailed by record drought, record heat, record wildfires, record flooding, and yet this is where America goes to get over a third of the country's vegetables and nearly three quarters of the country's fruits and nuts. That's asking for trouble, I think. And finally, the largest irrigated crop in America is the lawn. This is 2005 data from NASA, but according to NASA, there are three times more acres of lawns in the US than irrigated corn, enough to cover the entire state of Ohio. So what's the upshot? The farther away we are from our food supply, the more food insecure we are. Urban ag is not just a consumer novelty that has to be accommodated by our local government officials. Urban ag is utterly integral to the security of our food supply. It's part of the solution. But we can't start growing any of our food locally in any sort of volume in the urban environment unless we have a reliable and accessible food supply. Not food supply, water supply, excuse me. Water is the lifeblood of urban agriculture. And going forward, we're going to be needing that urban, everything that urban ag can supply. Thank you. I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you, Tim. Good lead in. Um, maybe not in order, that's all right. 
My name is Andy Zacco. I work for the City of Omaha in the Public Works Department. Uh, my title is uh, Engineering Technician. I get to issue grading permits for construction sites, making sure that when we're building stuff, we're not polluting the water around our area. My background though, I was an undergrad at Lincoln, graduated with a horticulture degree, worked with Kelly a lot um, when I was in school, got my graduate degree in, in planning, urban water resource planning and management. So my background is definitely a, a, mer uh, a kind of a connection between those two topics. And so I do a lot of what's called green infrastructure and working with a lot of the engineers who work at the city, operators, everybody there, and also doing some education outreach to figure out how do we manage urban runoff uh, the best way we can. And to piggyback off of what Tim was saying, water is really needed in urban areas because we have a very unnatural area by definition in an urban area. We have roofs, parking lots, sidewalks, driveways, lawns um, that don't act like you know, sponges that act more like a parking lot than anything. So we have this really tough dynamic to manage water because sometimes we have too much of it, sometimes we have too little of it. And so the background um, coming up through the years, I would have never scripted being here in front of you today talking about some of the stuff, but meeting folks like Gus and Tim, uh, Jim, Kelly, um, lots of different folks um, have led me down this road. And hopefully today we'll have some good conversation about what's working for you guys, what's working for us, um, and then sharing that and hopefully that propagates it into uh, some good solutions. Um, that said, I don't know if the slides are updated yet or not, but um, so some of the reasons um, I do what I do is because of my kids and my family. And so um, I like to, I, well, I'll even go back further. I love the weather. And so I've been watching the radar and the rain today quite a bit. And when I heard the thunder go off in one of the sessions, it was kind of one of those exciting times and it was no offense to the speaker, but I'm definitely more interested in the weather than any kind of a presentation at that moment because uh, one of the slides you'll see is me taking my son out doing stormwater chasing. And so uh, I was a trained storm spotter early on. I uh, went to Channel 3 uh, at one point where you get the ham, the ham radio uh, storm spotter uh, reports into the, the meteorologist so that they can report on those events when they're live on TV. That experience was, was a really interesting, fun, exciting one. And then come full circle to what I'm starting to do now with urban runoff and managing runoff here. We had a project in Elmwood Park where think of a 29 acres of a, of a storm sewer shed going into the storm sewers and daylights at the top of this valley. And the project was to create seven, we'll call them terraces or concrete walls. And those walls, thank you very much, appreciate that. <clears throat> is that 29 acres instead of going south all that volume we didn't have to have as big of pipes so we were able to save money by building these walls these terraces down the valley save some money we actually created some nice habitat um, and so there was a storm um, that was moving in my son's football practice it got canceled and so lo and behold we were just ahead of the storm so we raced to elmwood park got there, got some good pictures of water flowing through the newly constructed green infrastructure system there. Um, and so that's why I do what I do is because of my kids, and my family, and hopefully they don't uh, regret me for that and they think fondly back on it. So um, let's see, I'm gonna go back real quick. Um, I just for fun like to fly a drone. And so uh, my daughter was at dance practice and in the parking lot nearby, this is about 180th and Q Street. And so took the drone up straight up and just took some pictures to kind of get a feel for, for Omaha, our urban area. So this is West Omaha, right? And you can, you can see um, you got ball fields, you got schools, you got some acreage areas just off to the left. Um, you got Zerinsky up there in the top left corner. You got a whole bunch of stuff going on. And water is a major factor in all those places because the commercial areas need green grass. We have flood protection with Zerinsky Lake there. We have all sorts of storm sewers going on the streets. And so it's nice to take a moment and just kind of reflect from a higher perspective what's going on um, within our city and making sure that we're uh, keeping that in mind. I don't have to say why we manage water because everyone here knows 
why we need to manage water on, there's many different reasons, right? We have one, one water, but many uses, agriculture, food production, um, drinking water. And so this picture is great because you can see a storm right over downtown Omaha. And when it rains over downtown Omaha, there's not much green surface and all that water that's falling right there on downtown has to go somewhere. And so having had the luxury of working for the city for about 12 years now, it's, it's amazing what's required to manage that water when it lands on a, on a city like that and as it heads towards the Missouri River. Um, so we have plants, food, drinking water, right? This is a picture of Dundee Elementary School. Uh, top left side is a rain silo. It's about a 200 gallon uh, cistern. And so this, this school had a very muddy north side of their yard, or their school, I should say. And so we use a lot of different green infrastructure practices to slow water down, sink it into the ground and spread it out. And we are using water to our advantage to make sure the plants within the landscape grow. And we're using native and adapted plants. Nothing says you can't use uh, some edibles, you know, in different pockets of the garden. Like I grew up with rhubarb in the yard, which is actually a pretty plant that you can use ornamentally. And you can also harvest and make some rhubarb crisp as well. So. We have lots of water pollution. We deal with that all the time. So we want to keep water clean in the first place. So construction sites presents a tough challenge, especially when it comes in deluges. Uh, we also have to think about when we have all this runoff and it hits a stream that's not designed to have a fire hose shot at it. We have to fix that. We have to think about it. We have to you know, put our brains together and figure out how do we manage situations like this where the, the streams are degrading. Public safety, I like to take my kids around. And so this is a park near our house where you, know, you can definitely see that there's a lot of erosion taking place in these unnatural areas. Sometimes we have too much water. As you can see, when the Missouri River flooded in 2019, uh, we also have a lot of drought conditions, which we've experienced the last two years. And so every time I give a presentation, I tend to put this graphic up to show what Epley gets uh, every year uh, in terms of rainfall. So last year we had 22 and a half inches and 20, uh, 2020 it was 17 and a half. And so it's really kind of feast or famine. But if we can do stuff and get stuff to grow here, um, between our highest rainfall and our lowest rainfall, we're almost at our total rainfall we get in a year. So 27 inches on average, we're supposed to get 30 inches. We're never at 30 inches. So we always have to kind of adapt. So how can we store water in those uh, years like in 2014 with 44 and a half so that we can use it to our advantage uh, when we have drought conditions the last few years. Um, the scale of urban runoff is, is definitely a challenge. Adams Park is an area where we did a sewer separation project where about 273 acres drains down to the park and one of the solutions as part of the uh, combined sewer, uh, the CSO program was to create an area that uh, have water storage, create some wetlands. And so just to give you the scale of what that means to manage uh, 273 acres of a residential neighborhood, in 18, there was a two and a half inch rain. And all that rain, if you just did a simple calculation over that area, you're talking about 7.2 million gallons of runoff just in that one storm event. And so we have to have these large scale things um, to manage what's coming at us or we got to think about how we distribute solutions in the watershed to slow it down if we don't have the space for kind of this more regional type solution. Um, I will kind of wrap it up here so Gus can get up here. But the, as a landscape designer coming up uh, through that, working with homeowners, uh, this is a picture back in my landscape contractor days where somebody put a private storm sewer in their residential backyard to protect the pool that's to the right because she's at the bottom of a neighborhood with walkout basements and everyone's runoff is funneled right to her. So water just skips right over that particular great inlet, jumps right into the pool. She got frustrated and she thinks she can control water. And so her, her goal was to put in as her own storm sewer and protect her pool with the clean potable water and not have any problems. Well, that didn't work. She, I got wind of the project, came in there and so she had to come up with new solutions on how to slow that water down, manage it around her pool, and not pass the buck on to the neighbor down the street. So my takeaway is think about water as stormwater management. We can't control this stuff. We can't do flood control. We can't control everything that's thrown at us. 
So think about how we're gonna manage stormwater. How can we use it to our advantage? How can we reuse it again so as not to use it as a waste product? Um, green infrastructure, rain gardens, rain barrels, xeric landscapes, permeable pavement, all sorts of good stuff. This is Central High School, not too far from here, that did a green roof on their school edition. Beautiful uh, space, has potential for maybe not this particular installation, but schools could do green roofs um, and have food production. And all of a sudden now it becomes a teaching amenity. So think outside the box, have some fun with it. And then here's the picture of taking Mason out, <laughs> doing the stormwater chasing. And so I would, I'd be remiss to say, um, you know, that was what, tw 12 years ago? My son's graduating high school uh, this, this year. And then my recent, uh, daughter on the right, she'll be, or she is a freshman this year. So this is why I do what I do. And with that, I am gonna pass it on to Gus. Thank you guys. All right, good afternoon. Uh, let's see if our slideshow is, is coming up here. But in the meantime, thank you so much, Andy. And thank you so much, Tim. Uh, we have a great team here to present uh, a discussion. And I don't know if you can kind of tell where we're lining this up, but uh, we have a food culture that is in need of change as climate is changing. And then at the same time, our limitation is the way that our city is constructed, the way that it is. The city is not a natural place. Earth shattering statement there but it is not natural. We have to plumb it, we have to move water. And if it gets moved in one direction, we don't quite think of what's downstream and who is being affected from those changes. Uh, and you know, there was just one story that stuck out in, uh, stuck out in my mind when uh, we were thinking of a, a panel, and this was last summer. Uh, if anyone pays attention to the urban agricultural scene, uh, John Porter may know this, but there is a, a pop-up garden at 13th and Leavenworth last summer that act, during a thunderstorm in the early part of July, I think it was, and a torrent of, uh, or I'd say a, a river, ran down Leavenworth Street and wiped out an entire garden. Uh, it had many vegetables, pollinators, a lot of our friends and colleagues were working tirelessly to make this very pretty because it was in a nice spot in Omaha. It was very visible and everybody could see it. But uh, you know, I, I, I shed a tear for all the, all the people that worked so hard to make that garden look the way it was. And then they spent a week or two trying to salvage plants and trying to, to get people down there and volunteers. It's really sad to see that because you know the efforts are, are you know, you know, noble. We're truly really trying to feed people. All the food is going to local food banks. Uh, but that particular story is why I thought that we needed Andy up here is because uh, you know, it, it's tough to slow water down and understand that. So that, there's a whole landscaping discussion in design. How do you slow water down? And I think Andy did a very good job of you know, the, 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 the types of things he has to deal with on a regular basis when you're we're working with the city. Uh, so that, those are the kind of, uh, the boom or bust or the, you know, cycle that we have here, you know, as urban agriculture in, in Omaha. And uh, I'm gonna have quite a few uh, points and discussion points on the, the slides to talk about, but uh, being able to talk about, you know, designing your garden in your, in your backyard and you wanna be able to manage it you know, I don't want to hear people complain that the rain wiped it out or that, you know, you didn't foresee something along those lines. And uh, I think being able to understand what weather is like and what can happen here in Omaha. And uh, I have lived through quite a few flooding moments in my backyard where I've had to kind of unclog a drain and all these types of things. A lot of people probably are familiar with this story, but, uh, you know, for farmers and gardeners, it's, it's definitely, it, it basically makes your year or uh, can break it. And then there's a lot of other variables of uh, your modern urban or agricultural or your urban farmer has to deal with. Uh, but I think 
water as the topic of the day, uh, and I'm so glad it rained today, uh, to be able to kind of honor our discussion here. But we, we wait for these moments, and you, you don't know if you're going to get a nice steady rain or it's just going to be a fire hose moment coming in, down. And uh, to be able to understand your yard and understand the dynamics of when rain does come, uh, what you can do to slow that water down. Uh, so other topics uh, that I wanted to include for today that uh, I think are open for discussion is uh, water access. So I happen to work for a nonprofit uh, that is helping uh, lower income get lower income people get access to vacant properties to be able to garden. And uh, these vacant properties, if you can imagine, are not uh, plumbed with water. They do not have municipal water to them. So we are slowly and we are training people who have come from halfway around the world how to understand our weather system here and how to use the soil uh, to its maximum soil retention but also how to slow the water down around the garden so it is absorbing as much as it can. Uh, so water, water access and land access to be able to grow food in, in, the, in the city of Omaha is an important. And the constituents that we work for that are coming from halfway around the world and they've come and they try to shop in the Omaha supermarkets why do, why do you work so hard to, to plant everything you grow in your garden? And they say, because green vegetables are expensive. Green vegetables are expensive. And they know they want the, the, you know, the, the vegetables that they grew up with in their other country or the, wherever they came from. Uh, and just, it's a matter of being able to bring the seed here and, and grow it on their own terms. Uh, you're growing a, a very healthy food product that you, are, you wanna share with your family and uh, and share your traditions and share your culture along with that. So water access ends up being a, a pretty big deal in, in the urban agriculture world. Uh, we have actually, our nonprofit helps these uh, new Americans who are farming the property and we're paying sometimes uh, MUD uh, full rate minus, uh, including sewer rate sometimes uh, to be able to to uh, water and irrigate their gardens. And in the middle of a hot summer, you need every drop that you can get. And uh, those vegetables, they need to be watered. As Tim mentioned, he's like, they will die if you're not watering them in this 90 degree heat. Uh, so water access ends up being one of the bigger things. Uh, and then landscaping, as, as uh, I think Andy mentioned, there are a lot of things you can do to kind of slow water down but to encourage it to the area or where you need, uh, where you need the, the, the water and its retention. Uh, a, lot of, a, a big a problem that has uh, definitely been identified and studied uh, over the last few years, you may have heard of the urban heat island effect. Urban heat island effect is only exacerbating what urban farmers have to deal with. Uh, that urban heat island effect is actually evaporating all the moisture we're trapping. And in Omaha, and I don't know if it's quite the same in Lincoln, but we have very uh, mostly clay soils. That clay, the clay soils retain uh, that moisture pretty well, uh, but it really can't keep up when you have th two to three weeks of no rain and 90 degree weathers on a regular basis. And then the, not including the heat in Nebraska, one of the important things that we get on a regular basis, we get a lot of wind. So we get the sun and the wind that is constantly evaporating our soil. And uh, in the cities, you know, the asphalt, the concrete, the urban heat island effect is, it makes it very difficult to be able to hold on to your water as much as possible and as long as possible. So we, we need tricks. We need little landscaping tricks French grain, swales, uh, mulching, just mulching in general, and making little bioretention gardens, keeping your low spots in the yard as low spots. Uh, there are places that the water can just sit there and, uh, and slowly dissipate. It's not gonna sit there long enough to encourage mosquitoes. Uh, I think there are a lot of tools in our toolbox in, in, in a, a city like Omaha and city in Lincoln uh, we're mostly a state carved by wind and, and, and water, 
And we're also at the part of the state where all the water comes down to us from farming, farming industry west of us. So we know that uh, the water coming towards us is not of high quality. So the rain that falls in our cities and that falls on our gardens is the rain we want to use. Uh, we definitely do not want to, uh, you know, Lake Cunningham, all the lakes around us are, are having to deal with some kind of blue-green algae. You know, this is unfortunate, but it's also a byproduct of our powerhouse, our agricultural powerhouse that is upstream from us. Uh, it's unfortunate we can't really swim in many of our waterways, uh, but all the more reason in urban agriculture that we wanna, we wanna use the rainwater, use the seasonal moisture when we get it and retain it. Hold it on, hold on to it as long as possible. Rain barrels are great. A 55 gallon rain, rain barrel uh, will probably last you for two weeks, if it were full, two weeks during our hot June, July month. And you'd be able to water maybe six to 10 green pepper plants maybe. Don't you think, John? So, you know, something small, something postage stamp. But you would, you, if you want to keep a big garden going, uh, something that is worthy, that is going to feed your family, you're going to need those big IBC totes. Have you ever seen those big cube ones that, uh, you know, the food industry uses a lot? You would need three to four of them, daisy chain, to be able to water your typical garden if you ran out of water. Obviously, we can use city water, and I'm not advocating that you don't, but city water has things added to it that aren't necessarily good for plants. And rainwater is, is superior. It actually has polarity that actually does things with the seeds. It pulls the, the seed layer off more effectively. There's always gonna be a salt rim. If you look at all your potted plants inside your house, there's always a salt rim. And that is because of these additions that are in our municipal uh, city water. And uh, also, city water is very expensive. I have had to pay the bill for people watering these large gardens, and you can rack up a very expensive bill very quickly. It's like filling your swimming pool. So uh, if there are other ways to be able to irrigate and water your, your property and water your garden efficiently so that you have a good yield, you know, I, I think that uh, everything that Tim brought up about the, you know, being able to, you know, go above the water restrictions simply because we're producing local quality food for the, the neighborhood. Anyway, I feel like I've gone over. I thought I was eventually going to see slides, but no worries. Uh, we have a great discussion. Hopefully, I've flushed out some topics that, uh, that people uh, want to hear more about or hear about from our panel. Uh, does anybody have any questions that thought maybe we could feed, feed the group? Or? So does anybody have any questions? We'll start there. Yes, over here. Hey, how are you doing, Brock? Hey, I'm doing great. I have a question for Tim. Yes. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? All right. Okay, back in 2012, um, it was a Sunday afternoon, I was out in the garden and um, some television reporter drove by and stopped and they said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm gardening. She said, oh, I'm, I'm gonna do a story about you for tonight's, for tonight's news segment, okay? And it's gonna be about how you guys are saving water. And I said, 
we don't save water, okay? I mean, we, we, we need, lawns can go dormant, but we can't, so we, we water constantly. And so, so she changed the, the intent of her story and did a feature on, on the Holly Hamlet, and, and we moved on. That's the whole thing, urban agriculture, particularly in the heat island that um, was just being spoken of and so forth, it's so bloody hot. I mean, it's, we got concrete everywhere. We got asphalt everywhere. The, the evaporation is just incredible. Gus, Gus nailed it exactly. So what do you do to compensate for that? All right, because it's not gonna get any cooler in the city in our lifetimes. And so what we do is we water deep, we mulch heavily, all right? We always have our soil covered. We never let it dry out. When we pull out one crop, we immediately plant a cover crop on it, all right? We do this constantly. We water with water wands or with drip irrigation. Water is life. We need it, our plants need it, all right? But you gotta use it as carefully and as miserly as the Lincoln Water Department wants you to. You don't wanna treat it like your lawn and be, you know, cavalier with it. This is what we gotta do to try and save our water. My wife and I, to make sure that people will garden, because our, our neighbors are not necessarily inclined to do it. Like some of them do it because they think that Tim expects that of them, okay? And so to keep him from, you know, screaming at them, okay, they'll say, all right, I'll garden with you again, leave me alone, all right? So they'll, they'll go ahead and do this. But my wife and I pay for the water that we use in our neighborhood garden, all right? Our water bills for this last month were, just for the gardens themselves, over $700, all right? And that's using all of these careful practices that we can. We'll use rain barrels when we can, but if it doesn't rain, your rain barrel doesn't, your, your rain barrel doesn't fill up. So that's the sort of stuff that you're buying into. What motivates us to keep doing this is the fact that I don't think California is gonna to continue to be our greengrocer. It's not gonna get any cooler out there. They're not gonna start getting lots more rains on a, on a weekly basis where they get a nice gentle inch when they need it, okay? They'll get an atmospheric river after you know three years of no rain and so forth, but they're gonna have wildfires. Insurance companies won't even cover homes in California any longer. California is in deep trouble, which means that our greengrocer is in deep trouble. Where are we gonna grow these plants that provide the, the vitamins and the minerals that our bodies need? We're gonna have to start doing it ourselves. It can be done at the edge of town if we can get enough farmers that will take on that responsibility. But right now, the best way to make sure that you get the tomatoes and the peppers that you want every summer is to put in your own garden. And then the latest thing that Brock and I have been talking about with is that next year, I wanna be able to get shade cloth and shade art, shade cloth architecture because on a July afternoon when the temperature five out there, those plants don't wanna be out in that sun any more than I want to be, but they can't go in by the AC. And so we're gonna to have to find ways to nurture these little babies to keep them alive, all right? And it's gonna be demanding. So rearrange your vacation schedule. I hear that I hear that there are wonderful places to go in America during the month of January, all right? You know, go to those places, go to those places. In the summer, stay home and grow some food. Brock, did that answer your question? Yeah. Got another one, unless somebody else does. Okay, Josh, I got one for you. Uh, you talked a lot about the keeping the water there, the flood events and the practices that Sam Bortman from UNL is doing a study with the Urban, the urban Soil Health Project. It's a collaborative agreement with NRS, with us at NRCS. And he estimated, he got some research that there's 30 million gardens in the United States. So he's got a really fantastic program going with that. Um, and one of the things we're studying at NRCS, we're used to like soil health and, and things, grand scale of farming. Well, urban soil health, find too that we take fields that are silty clay alone, I think you mentioned clay alone soil, because of what you have, and how runoff can be intense if you hear to uh, cultivate that. And Sam Wortman has is going to try and prove that we can take infiltration rates from less than an inch per hour on a fractured soil to 15 to 20 inches per hour. And that's exactly what you were talking about by keeping the water there on your farm. So can you tell us like do you use cover crops or what other practice is there cultural practices? 
I think you and I have a conversation about like cover cropping and native ecosystems and things like that. So can you tell us what you do to keep the water on the site? Besides, you mentioned like um, biosoil and some of those things that keep the physical water there. What do you do for your soil health to help that situation? Thanks for the question, Brock. Uh, you guys can hear me? Okay. Uh, one of the neat techniques I've seen, if you've got a flat garden, uh, is to actually build up a soil rim around the entire edge of it so that as rain falls on your garden and maybe fills up on a downpour, a five inch rain moment that we're, we could be having, uh, that it takes time for it to break through that, that lip. You can make a pretty substantial lip ar around, a rim around the edge if you're or flat. Uh, if you have contour in your garden and you, uh, the best thing to do, I think uh, uh, Andy mentioned is terracing. Uh, terracing is, is you know, if you drive through Iowa, they have, they have terraces. Here in Nebraska, we have center pivots. Uh, you know, we, we do irrigation, they, they capture water, we, we pump it up from the ground. And uh, I think that Nebraska could do more terracing, could do more uh, just slowing the water down uh, and you don't necessarily have to put the rim. That was an, a, a neat idea I saw from the urban agriculture. Uh, some people from Burma that are realizing that we get these downpours, and I think that they just they did it on their own intuition. Uh, but another uh, another trick I think is really to to keep you know you mentioned cover crops, but anything that is just vegetative that is is covering the soil, so not having bare soil exposed is very key because uh, the soil temperature you want to keep very low. So I mentioned the heat uh, island, um, the heat island effect. Well, the same goes with your soil temperature. You want to keep temperature low. Not only does that exacerbate our city temperatures, but it also ends up killing the life, the bacteria, all the things that are supposed to be the healthy parts of the soil that uh, help you grow your food and help the roots deliver all the nutrition up into the plant. And uh, if the bare soil is exposed on a 90 and 95 degree day, uh, can you imagine what that brown, dark material and how much hotter it's getting? It's, I've seen people with digital temperature being able to read over 115, 120, just like it's an asphalt uh, parking lot. And so just having vegetation, you know, a lot of people like to OCD their garden and weed everything. And, you know, there's some weeds in my book that are, are totally permissible. Uh, I, I don't pull my creeping Charlie. There's a lot of things that I know are not robbing my plants from the vegetation or, or from the vegetation I'm trying to, to grow. So uh, we basically need to keep the soil temperature as cool as possible. And that's also using shade canopy, the trees, maybe having a garden not out in the middle of a field, but having a garden where, you know, it's blocked from the, the last three, four hours of the day of the hot sun. Those, you know, four o'clock to, to eight o'clock, well, as long as you got a majority of the day in the sun, those last four to five really hot hours of the day, wouldn't it be nice if it had a little respite, a little shade? So uh, those are just some odds and tri tricks, especially if you're thinking of a little city property, a little city garden. Don't worry about the, if you have one tree that is blocking your garden, that one tree may be actually saving your plants and allowing them to actually thrive a little bit more. Okay, let's start with, uh, with the last question. HOAs um, don't have a whole lot of, they call in a lot. They have questions. People sometimes complain about their neighbors. Some of those complaints that come in typically go to our parks department, but 
teaching people about uh, landscaping practices that you know thrive on what lands on it and then how to create a landscape that collects water uh, I could say um, educating people that native and natural uh, things that you can do at your house don't have to look like a goat lives there and, and is the mower and that it's you know all the commercial that comes to mind is is I forget what commercial was but you got the guy who's all natural and is this big exorbitant you know extravagant kind of a commercial right but all this is to say is uh, native plants uh, food can look very ornamental it can look structured okay so you kind of have to give and take a little bit so for me in my yard and growing up we've got the kids who want to play but around the periphery is where i have my garden you know plants at you know i got the tomatoes in the backyard or around the perimeter you know throwing it back to the rhubarb you can have rhubarb in a nice areas you can have elevated beds with uh with mint or different kinds of herbs so um you can fly under the radar pretty easily as long as you're kind of thinking with that mindset versus a wholesale i'm just gonna be in your face with raised planter beds for your vegetable garden so i think there's a lot of different ways people can come at it to um, either work with their hoas or try to fly under the radar a little bit so as not to quote unquote rock the boat with them um, what were your other questions again The one thing I'll just say about the seed is a lot of the rain gardens that we have around town are different areas. Um, Christine is one of our uh, landscape gardeners who does maintenance. And so with her, we've collected our own seed at different places. And so I know she will collect some seed from one garden and another one that's stressed out, she'll scatter them over there. And so we just locally kind of do that with our sedges, Baptisia, different, you know, little blue stem, uh, things of that nature. But uh, in terms of, Yes, yeah, so there are many urban agricultural groups that uh, teach their constituents uh, seed saving and canning. Uh, you got to have a, a community kitchen or at least a kitchen to be able to do the canning, obviously. But uh, we have great local partners, uh, City Sprouts, No More Empty Pots, The Big Garden are three of the ones I think of first uh, for, for both of those practices and teaching the community about them. Oh, oh, UNL also. Sorry, John is right there. <laughs> um, I have found seed saving to be too scientific. I don't think I'm smart enough to do it, okay? But you, anybody can save green bean seed as long as we're talking about an heirloom. And so I get most of my seeds from seed savers in Decorah, Iowa. And, you know, if you buy seed from them once, for your green beans and so forth, you will never have to buy seed again, all right? And you will get quality crops produced from doing that. And it's important to do this because one of the things that we're doing here, folks, is we're modeling for other people. Right now, this is a room full of outliers, okay? And I love you all, all right? Okay, but you, you are people, you know, who are willing, you know, to, to, to climb the mountain and just to see what it looks like. I, I wanna go see the view, all right, and so forth. Most of your neighbors are not, are not that way. And what they need to do is they need to see something tangible in their world and then start normalizing it. And so the more you model on every level, whether it's doing succession planting, whether it's seed saving, whether it's mulching, whether it's drip irrigation, whatever, whatever you're doing, or the fact that you don't take summer vacations because you're there taking care of your plant babies, okay? And so forth. the more you do that, the more you give other people information that they need about how this can be done. And we need to do this stuff. Our food system is in serious trouble. The, here, page one of the Lincoln Journal Star yesterday. Here we are, here's, here's the newspaper. It wasn't top of the fold, okay, but at the bottom, food prices soar amid export limits subhead is global shortages increasing cost. And then they talked to the former chief economist for the US Department of Agriculture who says that volatility is the new normal. Our food system is in uproar, it's in tumult, it's in trouble. 
and we can't do business the way that we used to. So the sooner we start this stuff, the better. And if you do something that upsets your HOA, and, and, and I agree with Gus, don't go out there and, and plant prairie to begin with, okay? I mean, you know, get people used to this stuff, normalize them a little bit, okay? But we need to start this conversation with people. You know, say, well, you're upsetting my neighborhood and now my property values are, you know, are, are, are going down and so forth. Oh, you like paying high property taxes, okay? I mean, so I, anyway, we got to get people used to this stuff. And you folks are the ambassadors for this. If you don't do it, who's going to? Where are the other outliers that's saying, oh, I want to go be that person? They're not out there, okay? We need to nurture these folks along. They will thank us for it. Food prices are going up. If you can say, man, my tomatoes were great this year and it didn't cost me a dime. I don't really have anything to add to that. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Well, that is a great question. Unfortunately, we were just flashy out of time. Uh, basically, I think you can visit with Tim afterwards, uh, but there's some great speakers that may also touch on this topic afterwards. So. All right, so our next speaker this afternoon will be John Porter. He's with UNL Extension and his and and works in urban agriculture as well. We got to get his We know we have your slides. We just got to pop back to them. So I'll turn it over to you, John. Thanks. So I'm John Porter. I am the urban agriculture educator with uh, Nebraska Extension. Uh, and also the statewide uh, program leader for the Horticulture, Landscape, and Environmental Systems team. And I'm actually going to touch on a few things that have been discussed previously, answer some of the questions uh, that folks had. Um, so if you don't know what Nebraska Extension is or what Extension is, because it's all across the country, um, we are the outreach arm of the Land-Grant University. So the Land-Grant University, UNL, uh, has offices that serve every county in, this, in the state of Nebraska. And we're the people that you can actually call for those things like which seeds can I save and how can I save them? Uh, and how can I can safely at home? Unfortunately, uh, some of the research that we've been doing, because we do everything science-based, uh, some of those recipes from grandma might not necessarily be safe. Uh, and so we've been doing updated research on canning and especially if you see canning recipes on Facebook I can guarantee I have seen some stuff that will kill people just this week on Facebook right do not get your canning advice from Facebook call the local extension office but the team that I work with um, we do horticulture we do uh, landscape and when we say landscape we mean basically everything you see outside is the landscape uh, and the environment. So we have folks who teach gardening, both for the landscape side of it, trees, shrubs, uh, landscape plants, lawns, etc. And Kelly will follow up. She's going to talk about one of our programs that we do to help homeowners be more efficient water users, even when they're watering those things like grasses and, and flowers and things. Uh, we have folks that, that actually do domestic water sources, so well drilling, and stormwater runoff. We have entomologists who focus on, uh, on my program, our statewide educators, on the creepy crawly bugs that we don't want to talk about, like bed bugs and 
lice and termites, and those things do come into our offices, and I scratch every time I hear the word bed bug coming from our lobby, right? Um, but we're the folks from the university, funded uh, partially through the USDA, uh, to, do, to be the outreach, to provide the, the research-based information to communities. A lot of our work these days is also engagement with communities. So we might not be the expert up on the stage telling you how to do things, but we might be gathering people together around certain topics, bringing people together to discuss and plan and create projects and programs. So I'm going to pepper a little bit of the work that uh, I've been doing in urban agriculture, we've been doing in urban agriculture, and others have been doing in urban agriculture, at least here in the Omaha area. Uh, with a, a little bit more information. So we've been talking about um, especially food. Um, urban agriculture is not going to feed everyone. We only have so much space within an urban area that we can grow food. But what it really does is it can fill gaps left by large-scale agriculture and our ir international and uh, national food supply chains. Uh, because there are gaps, um, as Tim talked about the statistic. We import 90% of the food that we eat in Nebraska, even though we are like one of the largest agricultural producers in the world. Um, and um, our food systems team at UNL Extension, which I was a, a founding member of, uh, we sort of have the quote that Nebraska feeds the world, but it does not feed itself. <laughs> and when we think about urban agriculture, we think about how do we fill those gaps where we have food deserts, where there aren't grocery stores. We think about, if you think about the early days of the pandemic and we had outages at grocery stores of produce items and people afraid that they were not going to be able to feed their families. And I think, I can't remember the exact st statistic, but it was at least five million new home gardeners in the United States in one year. <laughs> because people knew that if they grew their own food that they would have access to it. And that food requires water. Uh, so we were talking about uh, rain capture and, and runoff water. Uh, so our general recommendation for most plants is a minimum of, minimum of one inch of precipitation or water per week, <laughs> per square, and with, when we look at a square foot basis, so that is 0.6 gallons of water per square foot. <laughs> so if you have a 100 foot garden at home, it needs at least 60 gallons of water per week, <laughs> and that's at a minimum. If we think about when it's really hot and it's really dry, plants give off more water, they need to take up more water. And when plants are forming their fruits, so a watermelon is like 96% water, it takes a lot of water to make that watermelon. It takes a lot of water to make that apple. It takes a wa lot of water to make that tomato. So that plant needs way more water at that point when it's forming those fruits and vegetables than we eat than in any other time. So we need water for producing the food that we eat. So urban agriculture allows us to fill the gaps by addressing those food deserts and increasing access to healthy foods. And when I say healthy foods, we also have to take in a cultural context in that as well. We have people from all around the world that live in Nebraska and I've had conversations with people from all around the world that live in Nebraska uh, that they cannot go to the grocery store and find the food that they know how to healthily prepare at home. I had a conversation um, with a group of folks from Sudan and they go to the grocery store and they see all the fresh fruits and vegetables and Americans consume a majority of their fruits and vegetables now in a fresh, uncooked form. We eat salads, we do that kind of stuff. People from Sudan do not typically eat raw fruits and vegetables because it's not part of their culture. 
And also because they do not have the safe water supply to wash the fruits and vegetables, it needs to be cooked in order to make it safe for consumption. So many of the people from these different countries are relying on processed foods and convenience foods because they can't find the actual foods that they are used to preparing, like dodo, which is a form of pigweed. So Nebraska farmers spend millions of dollars in herbicides to eliminate pigweed. And one year, my group from Sudan, I, I was looking in the garden and I was like, there's a row that looks like pigweed. I was like, oh yes, we planted it. It's like, where did you find pigweed seeds? Oh, our cousin from Sudan sent it to us in the mail. It's like, okay, well, you probably should have cleared with that with me first, right? I'm sure, you know, that the Department of Agriculture will reach out at any time, right? Because we probably introduced a new noxious strain of pigweed to Nebraska, right? Um, but it's something that one person tries to eliminate, and it's the lifeblood of another person. People have a sense of that stability and control over their food access, uh, and it builds sovereignty and equity. People have control over their own food supply, whether that's saving seeds, whether that's growing your own food, your special cultural foods, that's all important. So the one thing that we often struggle with in urban agriculture is where agriculture and people meet. Uh, and not every municipality is on board. Uh, so I am happy to report that uh, within the last few months, the city of Omaha has passed an ordinance that supports urban agriculture by, well, it creates a way to basically permit agriculture, decriminalize agriculture uh, within the city. Previous to this uh, policy, it was technically not legal to have an urban farm in Nebraska, or in Omaha. Now it is legal to have an urban farm in Omaha, you just gotta pay permits, <laughs> right? So that's how the, uh, the one thing that's the hang up there that a lot of people are still worried about, but it is legal. Uh, in Omaha, urban agriculture uh, is left under the purview of the health department. So there's no law on the books that says you can have chickens or bees or rabbits or goats in the city of Omaha. It's a policy from the health department and the health department in many places are the folks that are in charge of animal agriculture because of the potential for zoonotic diseases and spread from humans to animals and, and those kinds of concerns. So when we look at the strategies that folks like Extension and other um, organizations use, uh, we look at, you know, what are the strategies that we look at? Uh, workshops and classes, you know, we have the Master Gardener uh, volunteer program through Extension, uh, where we have trained volunteers that go out through the community uh, doing lots of different things and teaching lots of people. Uh, we do one-on-one -on -one consultations, so I would say a good portion of our time is people calling us on the phone or sending us emails or stopping into our office or stopping us in the grocery store uh, or, you know, stopping us at the liquor store or wherever you are <laughs> uh, to ask you a question, uh, right? Uh, and um, so those one-on-one -on -one consultations, that very specific problem someone's reaching out to you about. Um, even farm visits and site visits and things like that. So I talked about we, we go out into communities and we talk about problems and bring people together and facilitate uh, things like that, or I do a lot of that. And then we do media, social media, uh, we write publications, we have fact sheets, we have all that kind of stuff that we do an extension to try to uh, inform people. We have a TV show, Backyard Farmer, a lot of people uh, might know what uh, that is. It's uh, just wrapped up its 71st season. Uh, uh, Kelly and I are both regular members on that panel, though I will say that my time is short because I am the urban agriculture person for 10 more days because I found a new job, exciting new job. Um, but that's one thing I'll be, be missing is my time on Backyard Farmer. Uh, but we do production methods. We talk about conservation. And then we also, when we're talking about sustainability, we also have to talk about, well, if someone's doing agriculture and farming, 
how do they do that as a business to make money? Because if, if you're not making money, you're not going to continue doing it. And so things like that and farm business are things that we work on. So if we look at some of the urban agriculture issues around water, you know, access to water sources, Gus will tell you that is one of the biggest limitations is we have vacant lots all over cities. They do not have sources of water. We can do um, rain barrels, but if you don't have a building, how do you collect rain barrel water because there's no runoff from a roof? Um, there's uh, not a lot of, you know, hookups for water systems. And if you were on a vacant property and you wanted to have uh, the water system come and put in a hookup for you, it could be probably between, between ten and twenty thousand dollars for that one hookup uh, from scratch. And we also do have runoff issues. We've been talking about that uh, throughout. But there are opportunities for efficient water usage both for food production, which I'll talk about one of the methods that most people don't realize and think about when we think about urban agriculture. Uh, and then Kelly will talk about um, uh, efficient water use in our landscapes and one of the big programs that we're doing uh, there. But it is sort of, um, I guess, you, you wouldn't think this, but if you think about growing crops in a very small space, and we're growing crops outside, when you use water, you know, a lot of it will run off or it will go into the atmosphere. So a lot of urban production and a lot of interest is growing in Nebraska and beyond uh, for hydroponics. And you would say, well, that's all water-based. So how is it not using more water? But what it does is it actually recirculates the water and uses the water over and over and over again in production. So it has a high efficiency rate for producing large amounts of food in a small area. Now there are still lots of inefficiencies, there are lots of issues, it uses a lot of energy, so we have to solve those issues, but that's one of the growing areas of uh, production agriculture that we see in our urban areas uh, is hydroponics and aquaponics where we're also introducing fish into there. And it's amazing to see what people are doing in Nebraska. Not only are they growing fruits and vegetables in hydroponics and greenhouses, but some of our aquaponics producers, there's a shrimp farm in Nebraska. You can uh, buy locally grown shrimp. There's an Atlantic salmon farm in Nebraska where you can buy locally grown salmon. And I am out of time, so I'm gonna tell you, you can also do it on a home scale uh, with lots of different systems. Uh, so that's all that I have. And you can ignore uh, that email address. It'll only be working for another week. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I don't know if we're, are we launching right into Kelly or do we do questions? I have, what? Straight to Kelly, come on up. Good afternoon. Um, I am Kelly Fian, and I am an extension educator for horticulture. And I'm part of uh, the same team as John, that horticulture, landscape, and environmental systems. And uh, I'm here to talk to you. It's a little bit different. It's, I'm going to share with you information about our water dogs program. Okay, we have a, there's a, we have a team. Um, we call it the urban uh, water team. And there's a group of a variety of people, but there's a number of us that are horticulturists on that team. And this, this my talk is, is, okay, I'm going to go there. It's very grassroots, pun intended. It's about grassroots, or at least watering turf grassroots. But grassroots in the sense of, I'm going to tell you what this, uh, what this program is, why we're doing it, how we're doing it. So when we were discussing what are some water conservation things that we can do for home, home landscapes, home gardens, it's pretty well documented that, you know, 30 to 40 percent and sometimes more of water use during the summer is for lawns and landscapes. So how can we focus on that? And we know one of the issues is this issue of set it and forget it with those automatic irrigation systems used to water lawns. So that's one that, one that we decided to focus on. We kind of adapted this program. Um, we have other extension staff in other states that had done something somewhat similar we combined a couple of those programs to come up with the program uh, that we are doing and we are implementing and have been for about two and a half, three years. So, you know, this issue of set it and forget it. I, we've all seen this. 
where water is running off into the street. Um, you know, we always say pavement won't grow, no matter, you know, just won't grow no matter how much you water it. Um, a lot of these systems run when they're supposed to run, 4 a.m. to 8 a.m., the most efficient time to water. But that's also the time when people are in bed sleeping and they don't observe them, they don't see them, so you might have broken heads or you might have overwatering on pavement and so on. Um, and they're also that set it and forget it, you know, they're, they're running even during rain, they're running when the soil's moist. A lot of times they run for such a short per period, they're watering shallowly. So it's not even that, it's not healthy for the turf grass and that's the far slide with the yellow lawn. Um, Overwatering is not the only reason that those lawns are turning yellow, but it is a contributing factor. So we decided to focus on this issue of set it and forget it. And we came up with the Water Dogs program. And we are, John shared with you who master, what master gardeners are and who they are, so I don't have to go through that. But is, uh, we wanted to work with extension master gardeners in kind of a train the trainer type program. Why did we call it Water Dogs? Because we had this cute picture of a dog with a hose in its mouth. And that's the only reason we called it Water Dogs. But it's one of those things where, you know, it, it fits. It's kind of fun now. Water Dogs, Water Dogs. So, and you, you can see our learning objectives there, what we were trying to teach the master gardeners, which we hope and which they are doing that. We don't hope they are already doing it, in turn teaching others and setting examples. But we wanted to increase that understanding of plant water and oxygen needs uh, and more. John said we get a lot of people calling our offices and asking questions and visiting with us. And it doesn't take long to realize um, and I'm not blaming them. I mean, I have a degree in, in this, and I've worked in that area for over, over yes, over 40 years. So I, I know, but there's a lot of misunderstanding um, just about plant needs, you know, turf grass water needs, and just this idea that roots need oxygen just as much as they need water. So if it's too dry, there's not enough water. If it's too wet, there's not enough oxygen. And that's just not healthy for our plants. Um, just in increasing the knowledge of efficient irrigation practices, especially with automatic irrigation systems, although we do some with just manual irrigation as well. And we are focusing on that soil health management. Um, as we know, especially in urban areas, you, you know, it, that's just, soil just tends to be bad, those urban soils. Um, I recently heard a talk at, in Iowa, uh, I, wish, I, I wasn't even planning to say this, but Okay, I'm not even gonna go there. What she was talking about, there's no such thing as a native plant out anywhere in an urban area because there's no urban, there's no native soils. <laughs> not sure I agree with that, but you all know that. They strip off the topsoil with basement excavation soil, it's poorly compacted. So part of the program, um, we're focusing on just that soil health and how it affects water use and infiltration of water uh, just plant roots, plant growth, and so on. So I just kind of want to tell you, you know, what, what, what we did and how we did it. So we started this in 2021. We kind of had a pilot. Um, we did a webinar in April, and we invited master gardeners all across the state that you can participate in this webinar. You can see we had 96 participants, which was awesome. You know, we, we told them we're going to teach you how to water your lawn correctly. You know, a lot of times they would prefer that we teach them how to grow vegetables or flowers or th landscaping, landscape design. So to have 96 master gardeners get on and participate in this, that was really, um, you know, really hopeful for us and we were very happy about it. But then what we did is we told, out of those 96, we decided um, there was six of us extension educators who work with uh, master gardeners and we felt that we could handle about five for each of us to work with through the summer with what we were going to do. So we, tr we aimed to get 30 master gardeners that summer to participate and we did get 24. So again, we were very pleased with that. They had to agree to shut off their automatic irrigation system for the summer and only water when a soil moisture meter that we provided them or a screwdriver um, or just turf signs, turf grass signs of needing irrigation. So, in, in the majority of them did do this. Not everybody, but the majority of them did follow this. We also had them collect uh, some weekly data for us, rainfall, if they irrigated, if they didn't irrigate, what they were finding. Some of that was kind of citizen science 
just to help, help them be more in tune with their landscape, with their turf, with their soil, and so on. And then in each of our areas, the six of us, um, we did some one-on-one -on -one education with those master gardeners. So we went out to their home, we conducted an uh, irrigation audit, and I'll share a little bit more about an irrigation audit. Um, and with my five master gardeners in my county, each, each of these audits took about three to five hours. So it did take some time, um, but it was very eye-opening for those master gardeners. Um, we practiced, we just kind of practiced using a soil moisture meter, a screwdriver, it didn't take a lot of time. Um, we tested the soil compaction with these penetrometers, um, just because soil compaction is important to water use, water infiltration, efficient watering, and just uh, root health. And we kind of a carrot is they got a soil sample as part of all of this. So, and we reviewed some new fact sheets that we printed. In October, we got to get, towards the end of October, we got together with everybody and said, so this was a pilot. What did you learn? What did you think? Um, what can we do different? What can we do better? Most important, we want you to help us teach others now. So who's willing to help us do that? So very positive. Um, I mentioned the fact sheets. John talked about how we uh, do publications and things like that. So these are a set of fact sheets that we did put together. Um, and you can, go, you can find them at the website at the bottom. It's easier just to search water dogs plus UNL. And you'll come up with the website. We also have uh, our webinars. Some of our recorded webinars are on there, but you can also access these fact sheets. But they're just very easy to use, front and one page, front and back, um, how to on watering turf efficiently. I do want to mention that for that first year, that 2021, we did get grant funding um, from the Nebraska, the PI grants, public information and education grants from the Nebraska Academy of Sciences with funding from the Nebraska Environmental Trust. And that's what helped us to purchase those moisture meters, uh, uh, print those fact sheets and some of the other things that we did. So some impacts and results, I kind of just pulled out some very simple things that I thought were meaningful. Um, we use the University of Nebraska Bureau of Socio Sociological Research, or BOSHER, is probably a shortened name for that. And we did, we, we surveyed these people two years in a row so we could get two years of data. And I just, we have a thick, you know, it's probably about this thick, and I just pulled out some very simple things to share with you today. Um, but of that group, you know, 59 very closely followed that turning it off. They, they did what we asked it, in a nutshell. Some of them, if they went on vacation, they turned it on and left it on while they were on vacation, for example. And about 32% of it followed it somewhat closely, I think, with some of those that, you know, left it on during vacation and things like that. But 69% said that they saw a big difference between the irrigation frequency that they had been doing um, based on the soil moisture versus just the preset timer, the set it and forget it. So they did notice a huge difference. 91% of them felt they reduced water use by following this. 67% felt they had better turf. So they were worried. They're a little bit skeptical. They're like, eh, you know, my turf grass going to dry up. Is it going to start to go dormant? You know, but 67% of them felt they had better turf. And 75% improved their irrigation efficiency. And as a result, again, this was over a two-year period. Um, this was the 2021 percentages that I'm using, but the second year around, we had very similar. Um, and so that showed that they were continuing to use that and implement that, and we hope that continues. But 83% of them planned to just turn out the irrigation system and only turn it on like they had done that first summer. You know, when the soil moisture meter, or uh, most of them like the screwdriver better than the soil moisture meter. And they were, they were inexpensive $10 soil moisture meters, and they kind of would tell you if it was dry or if it was wet. Um, but it would never kind of be in between. So most of the master gardeners in October said, well, we don't like those moisture meters, but we like the screwdriver. <laughs> we, we could tell more with the screwdriver. 61% um, plan to water based on the turf grass water needs. That was part of their education. What does turf grass really need? I know you often hear that one inch a week, right? Um, people will ask me, so how often should I water and how much should I put on? And I always tell them I have no idea. 
because I, you might, some people have sandy soil, some people have a heavy clay soil or compacted soil, some people have a lot of shade. Um, there's microclimates. So what we tell them is turn on the system, whatever you use, water until that soil is moistened uh, for turf, four to six inches deep. Use a screwdriver to help you tell that. Um, and then wait to water again until that turf, you know, you can't, when you stick the screwdriver in, you can no longer, you can tell it needs water. It's dry, it's hard to penetrate, comes out warm, feels warm, no soil sticking to it. Um, and then you just, I tell them, you get to know your own lawn or your own site. So I, we don't usually say water one inch a week because that might be too much. Maybe it'll be too little sometimes. So in, in that core aeration, that was part of our um, soil, uh, improving soils, like relieving soil compaction. Um, it's tough, not a lot you can do with an established lawn, <clears throat> but core aeration is one thing that can be done. So these are, I'm gonna let you read some of these comments. They were kind of, kind of fun. These were just some testimonials. Definitely reduced irrigation. I'm hardly watered at all in Omaha. Based on Andy's presentation, I saw that 2021 was a pretty good year for precipitation, 33 inches, but um, they hardly watered at all. The one person said we watered about seven times, whereas prior to that, they'd been, their irrigation system had run two to three times a week. And that summer, they, watered, they turned it on seven times. So that was a great reduction. Um, brought a lot of awareness. <laughs> Made me realize my neighbors water too much. Um, one of, my, one of my master gardeners, uh, their neighbors, they saw us out there doing the irrigation audit. So that increased, what, what were you doing with those tuna cans out there and those flags? What were you guys doing? So, our neighbor, so they would ask them and they told them what they were doing. So I know I had at least one master gardener where the neighbors told them, um, I didn't water until you guys turned on your system and watered. So that was kind of trying to what, be what we are trying to achieve. So it was kind of interesting, um, but it, it did probably more of them said, yeah, my neighbors water way, way too much. <laughs> so now, that, now they realize, recognize that. Um, I like the one got my husband to understand we can turn the system off for two to three weeks. Um, what, this was one of my master gardeners. She had a brand new home and had really not thought about the compaction issue. So just she, as she said, learned so much about compacted soil um, why her water wasn't infiltrating. Um, and she, she just got out a hose and she kind of manually watered some of those dry spots. Ongoing, we continued and went ongoing. Um, 2022, we, we did irrigate, we had so much, you know, 96 people came to our first webinar. So we did three. Um, April, the ones we do in April are still kind of an introductory, kind of a basic. And we asked more master gardeners to get involved. Um, and then we started doing a little bit more in depth because um, people started to say, you know, I, I'm not even sure I know how to turn on it or they know how to turn it on, but they don't know how to adjust their system very well. Um, some of them didn't even know how to shut it off. I, one of them did, one of the spouses did, obviously. Um, but some of them would say, I'm not even sure my husband always does it or my wife always does it. And so anyway, with, we started just Help, helping them to learn more about understanding automatic irrigation systems and how they might be more efficient and so on. And then we started the neighbor to neighbor workshops where we asked the master gardeners, will you hold a workshop at your home? Invite your neighbors and we'll invite some other people, share what you learned. Um, we'll demonstrate doing an irrigation audit. And, and we've had, I don't have the numbers for 2022. You can see in 2023, we did 18 of them reaching about 258 people. So we hope to keep growing the program. Um, and then we assembled irrigation audit kits uh, this summer. Just we started to assemble them because for an irrigation audit, we tell people you need 20 tuna cans. So how many people are gonna go out and eat 20, tuna can <laughs> 20 cans of tuna so they have 20 tuna cans? So we put together some of these kits so we can then say, oh, by the way, uh, we have these available. You can check them out. Um, I might mention on the bottom there, uh, one of our webinars was uh, talking about soil moisture sensors that people can set up. Um, there's override things where you put the rain, when it rains, there's kind of an override. Um, but there's also the soil moisture sensors and they're attached to your phone, an app that's on your phone. You can shut your system off or on if you're out of, 
town. So we're starting to teach them about some of these other things as well. Uh, irrigation audit, again, here's one. We're doing it on, at one of our master gardeners at the neighbor to neighbor workshop. As you can see, there's kind of a grid system of tuna cans set 10 feet apart and we'd flag them. We run the system for about 15 minutes. Um, and it, it's eye opening because while we were running it, um, a lot of them were like, oh, I didn't know that head hit halfway across my driveway. So just observing it and saying, turn on your system, you know, when you can actually see it running. Um, but the other thing that was very eye-opening for them was the amount and the lack of uniformity. Um, one tuna can might have a drop in it, and another one might have had a half inch. And so what most of them do is, you know, you water for the, your lawn, starting to look, if you do shut off the system, you're saying, oh, there's that one spot there that's getting a little off color, I must need to turn my system on. Well, that's the one spot that's getting the drop of water. So it helped them to recognize, you know, how ununiform some of these systems are. I'm not sure how to solve that problem because we're not irrigation experts, and that's a tough one. But at least that awareness and, you know, I had one master gardener that knew that, and that's where she would just take a hose and water some of those spots rather than turning on the system and watering the whole lawn. So, oh, I'm out of time. So these are the landscape practices uh, that, now is my last slide, that we... Uh, you know, are trying to change, or trying to teach about just that inefficient irrigation, overwatering, poor, no soil management, unsustainable design, treating rainwater as a nuisance. Um, these are some of the other things that we're doing, right or bad plant, bad, pla bad place. There's a lot of good plants planted, but they're planted in the wrong place. Um, and over fertilizing as well. So, thank you. If anyone's interested in a water dog workshop, um, I know we said master gardeners do it at their homes, but as extension staff, um, we're, we're willing to come out. I know Sarah and Lincoln has done them with homeowners associations. Um, John's been doing, uh, John Fetch, not John Porter, has been doing them in Omaha. I, think, I know he did one or two homeowner associations. So let us know if you're interested. Mm -hmm.